Welcome to Digging, a podcast where we dig into the heads of creators. In this series, we're focusing on the spark, the very beginning of inspiration for an artist, where it comes from, what you do with it, and where you go with it. We're aiming to focus on how and why artists get into their field. So if anyone is listening and wants to pursue music or art or writing professionally, these are the stories of people who have pursued it, how they did it, and then how little money they have now they've started. But please do not give up. If you are just getting into this, you are our beacons of hope and we are the wretches of evil clawing from the darkness at the fountain of youth. We aim for this to be as inspirational as possible, despite that previous sentence. In this episode, I'm talking to Matthew Thorne, the director for our video, The Only Boy Racer Left on the Island. Um, In this episode, you'll be able to tell I found Matthew's insights and philosophies very interesting, which is why I forgot to actually talk about the music video in question until about 20 minutes in. Uh, But hopefully you'll find something interesting in the rest of what we had to say. Um, We've still never met. We did this over Zoom. Matthew just got back to Berlin from Australia, uh, and I'm in a smelly little room in Leeds. But yeah, we've had a few conversations, obviously. Um, when he was pitching the idea to us and then since then uh, but this was really lovely he's, he's a very wise young man as you'll be able to tell um, here's a quick biography that I have gleaned from his website and his production company Stink Films' his description of his work so he's Matthew Thorne is a young Australian director and photographer who currently lives and works between Berlin, Melbourne and Adelaide whose work focuses on the relationship between time, community, land mortality and spirituality. He shot a reportage photography series across Iran, South America and Russia which has been published and exhibited worldwide and his recent work includes The Sand That Ate the Sea, a film and uh, photographic project documenting the land, community and mysticism of Andamooka, an opal mining town in South Australia. Uh, Dipped in Black, a film and uh, photographic project created with initiated Aboriginal man and artist Derek Lynch. Uh, which catalogues in dream and memory his childhood in the Australian central deserts. Uh, other work includes photography for Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds album Ghostine, additional unit direction photography for Ridley Scott's Alien Covenant and photography on Justin Kurzel's feature film The True History of the Kelly Gang. And uh, his films and photography have been nominated and awarded at the YDA, One Show, Can Lions, Award, Lear, Berlin Music Video Awards, Flickfest, Revelations, Perth International Film Festival, St Kilda Film Festival, Australian Photography Awards, and the Australian Directors Guild Awards. It's, yeah, I mean, I could go on as well, I left some stuff out, it's just nuts. It was a pleasure talking to him about creating and identity within the work, um, especially as an Australian artist, and we touch on it, and I'm now more interested in that than I was before, which uh, sounds pretty dumb of me, Um, but he spoke about uh, life as an Australian artist so interestingly that I found myself doing a lot more research on both Indigenous artists and Australian artists, white Australian artists, and their respective relationship. So yeah, I found this a very interesting chat. I hope you enjoy it. If anyone is listening to this podcast that we made, if anyone is listening and they might be underage, then please be aware that there are some naughty words. If you don't know them now, you will by the end. Well, one of the things I was going to ask, actually, mm-hmm. is that the way that you just referred to living to Berlin was like quite compact, right? There's quite a lot of you living in quite small, well, like, you know, over a small area, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people. But then you, you seem to concentrate when you're making stuff on quite rural, vast landscapes. Do you reckon there's a um, sort of a comparison between the two places, almost like you live in one and then you find escapism in the other? Um, I think it's something to do with, like, I'm reading this great book. Um, like I think the best the best book you can read is a book that you read and you realize you should have read it thirty years ago or ten years ago or something <laughs> like this, you know. And so I, I started reading this book and it's uh, um, it's called um, From the Deserts the Prophets Come, and it's about the creative spirit in Australia from 1770 to 
1972. And it was basically this incredible work of part academia, part fiction that was created basically as a way to document and talk about what Australian art was and, and what Australian artists had done, you know, because that's something in Australia they don't really teach us. We spend a lot of time looking at Europe, um, yeah. which is understandable, you know, because the better art tends to be here in some ways, you know. That's why I'm also living here. Mm. Um, but the, the book's really interesting because it talks a lot about how the best Australian artists tend to, you know, be born and grow up in their land, right? Then they leave and they go to Europe or America and they get kind of fertilised by this other um, other form of thinking or, or other um, experience. And then they come back and they kind of transmute that into work about the land. And, and there's a lot of cautionary tales in the book about the artists that don't do this. So if you stay, you become very parochial and provincial and if you if you leave and stay in Europe and try to become one of the Europeans, then also like yeah, it generally ends up with you being like a footnote in the, in the book about impressionism, you know, oh, right. um, really <laughs> yeah. like it doesn't go so well, you know, you might make a living, but you know, it's, it's not your place. Yeah. Like there's, there's a lot of great Australian painters who are actually really important figures. I learned, you know, in, mm. in the impressionist art movement, for example, um, you know, and were contemporaries of Manet and Monet and, and that scene in Paris at the time. Yeah. Mm at the turn of the century, but you don't hear about them. So, so it makes a really strong intellectual argument for the role of the artist, you know, as someone who leaves and learns and returns uh, yeah. in an Australian paradigm. Pilgrim. The Pilgrim, yeah, which is true pilgrim, for lots of countries. Yeah. It's not unique. To, it's a very colonial, you know, viewpoint, I think. Mm. But um, um, I was... Uh, but, no, sorry, no, sorry, just to wrap it up, I guess, it's like I think, like, that definitely made it something about, like, living in these urban spaces and in that art and life that Europe gives you, but they're making work in Australia mm. and that landscape is generally wide and open. Yeah. Yeah. Did that I was the question? <laughs> De- oh, like a long and, way. <laughs> and, and the rest, right. man. Yeah. yeah. It answered about seven more questions that I had. It was really like a, <laughs> that was, that was a strike of an answer. But um, I watched an interview with you and the composer, for the uh, short film you made, yeah, Luke. which was really interesting on YouTube. And it was uh, it, at one point you were talking about Australian identity mm-hmm. and how um, the uh, how, how the identity doesn't um, for, well, not for the indigenous people of Australia, but for mm-hmm. um, a large white portion of Australia, mm-hmm. how it doesn't stretch back particularly far and how mm-hmm. culture is almost finding its feet. I think that was, that was the expression that he used, which mm-hmm. I found really interesting because mm-hmm. uh, do you find that the finding... The finding of feet culturally, this is going to be an abysmally worded question, That's by right. the way. The finding of, the finding of feet mm. culturally plays a part in your work and it, it's uh, mm. Australianism. I mean, I, I think at the time, you know, when I said that, I think I probably hadn't done enough research about what that history of Australian art really was. Right. And I think if I could go back in time and talk to that version of me, I would probably say, read these books. Um, <laughs> but um, but it's interesting because I think what I'm learning is that the Australian culture is actually very disappointingly recursive. So it feels right. like for some reason in, in our kind of colonial um, shame, mm. we get about 30 years into a really good idea and a really good process. And then it's not even to say that we go backwards. We just decide for some reason to erase the last 30 years and pretend that there isn't anything. Yeah. And so, you, and it becomes very, and it's very modern always, right? Because you're, you're wedded to the spirit of the times. Mm-hmm. So you, the struggle I think in Australia is to actually identify not just with that rather short colonial history, because there is great depth in it, even though it's quite short, but is actually to also, you know, challenge ourselves to communicate with and learn from and identify with, you know, the history that came before that, which is the indigenous history. And that can only mm. really be done in authentic interaction and communication with that community. And that's, you know, a journey for sure because you're you're a colonizer. But I think somewhere at the end of that is like, you know, where um, where the boots hit the ground, you know, mm-hmm. which is like, okay, we had a time before, you know, 60,000 years of history that belonged to Indigenous Australian community um, and the land, of course, still belongs to them. But... Um, 
you know, then we had this colonial period, which has its own identity and history and while often dark and bleak and rather unethical, to put it lightly, is mm. still a history, you know. And now we have a time that comes next, which is a time about ideally what we can maybe make together, you know, because we're there, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think that's interesting for me in the work, to talk about how cursed white Australia is, you know, literally also, you know, mm. um, and, uh, and to talk about, you know, how we're basically in many ways an amazing country but also in many ways really screwing up the golden basket, you know, like lots of money, lots of resources, lots of opportunity, lots of peace, relative monoculture for better or worse. These things tend to make a country rather rather rich and we're rich but in the dirty, cheap and easy way. <laughs> I'm interested in us being rich in, in, a, in a more more contiguous way. And in a way that's paying into generations to come. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And part of that. I think you did. I, yeah, I think you achieved that as well. I think that the, the way that you seem to um, follow these themes in your work is by portraying these like incredible landscapes at times untouched, mm. but then as well as focusing on the people within them, mm. you get to sort of, um, you, your camera reacts to the boundary between the two mm. things, which I find really interesting. That's where I get this, you get a, uh, an almost hyper-realistic version of the identity happening in front of you mm. because you'd have, for example, long shots of people's faces mm. uh, and, and their face would tell a story in and of itself. Mm. And then the background to that is this beautiful um, mm. desert. It's, it's a place that I've never seen before, but, you know, they, they, they exist on Earth, but they couldn't be anywhere else in the world. Mm. And I think it's the, it's the combination of those things. There's a very, hum- a very human face, if that makes sense. Mm. On, at the front of the fame, and it's it's decorated by this um, by this untouched landscape around it, and it's like the person is sort of like intrinsically within this. Exactly, place. I think that's, that's the thing. Right. Like, it's, it's interesting, like you know, it's a it's a very you know indigenous notion, um, you know, not to all community, but to certain communities, indigenous communities in Australia, which is like that the land works on the people, the people don't work yeah. on the land. You know, there's a very modern, contemporary neo-colonial notion of what we do in the world, which we witness, mm. which is that we're destroying it. You know, we work on the land. But I think there's something particularly about that Australian land that is the opposite of this. You, know, you can build as many yeah. mines as you want. You can, you know, have as many airports and shipping tankers and beautiful little houses with picket fences. But at the end of the day, the land is working on you. Um, and that's, that, <laughs> yeah. that's kind of, I think, what I, I hope is in some of, some of that way that people seem to be growing out of the ground rather than, you know, planting themselves in it. Yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> That's a beautiful way to put it. The, um, another question I was going to ask is, I, I guess, I guess related mm. to all of this is a recurring themes to be on, uh, familiarity and family and routine mm. I've written. Uh, as in that's the sense that I get that when you're watching a camera it's, it almost feels like a um, in a documentary style uh, do these themes appear to you and are they important if they do? Um, I mean I think family is at the root of probably some of the art that I love the most like one of my favourite film directors is a guy called Yashihiro Ozu which I'm sure I'm pronouncing terribly you know but like Japanese, my Japanese <laughs> Forgiven, is don't worry, non-existent I've, I've um, done much worse <laughs> but um, um, but you know he, he does the most incredible films and they're really just seated around you know what, what family interaction is and what family is and what that means to us and, and how family builds you know people and builds the world right um, and I think also part of that that became quite interesting is like, look, you know, when when suffering and things that are, are hard and are traumatic happen in your life, they they should, I think, end up in your art. And and so like when I was like 22, my father passed away and very like unexpectedly. And I think like that experience really galvanized into my life this notion of like, you know, you know, when you don't have something in in your space that you've had, you realise what it left behind that isn't there, you know. Mm. And so I think it gave me a certain feeling about what I was missing or what I had missed or what I'd taken for granted and, and, and how that was shaping me. And, and, you know, I think that's a really important part of family as well. So mm-hmm. it's not something that I set out to do at all, 
you know, I just think it just is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, is there any, uh, so in portraying grief, uh, or these p- very emotional circumstances in which anyone can find themselves grief and traumas and things like that. Uh, is there any, any reservation in the way that you create or are you always trying to go sort of full fledged into this idea and incorporate yourself entirely within the grief and then the art? Oh man, that's a very dangerous thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? No, I don't know. You know, yeah. uh, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, I would have been like, "Absolutely, see you at the end of the fucking hole." You know, like, yeah. like <laughs> but I don't know if that's true anymore. And I and I think there is some kind of myth we, we we've really learned. You know, I, I think especially that gets really sold to white, you know, white men, white men, white male artists, which is like mm-hmm. give all these people who are also white and male who are the icons of art, and they are all. Um, you know, tortured, the ones we really want to talk about, they're the ones who are tortured. You know, it's like, you know, the, the nice, the, the nicest and happiest one is the guy who cut off his ear living in a cottage alone in, you know, rural France. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the Van Gogh story is rather like one you can tell your kids. Um, <laughs> yeah. Whereas I think, um, and, you know, and that's true whether you're talking about Pollock or, or, or whoever, you know, like there, there's this notion that you have to destroy yourself. You know, Hemingway destroys himself, you know, as a writer. Um you know, and I'm pointing to rather misogynist male figures, but, you know, like they were the, the figures that came into my life when I was a young man and I wanted to be an artist. They were the people, mm. the, the people I was pointed to. Um, and I don't know that that's true, actually. I think some kind of um, observational distance is, ra- is rather important, maybe. Also just so you survive. Um, yeah. You know, I've watched a lot of really amazing artists and film directors get beaten down by the work that they're doing, you know, and like really psychologically screwed with and actors too. And I actually really think there's something very safe in not doing that. Mm. Like I would, I would, or I would encourage an actor who, who I worked with to not try and do it method. Maybe right. do your research method. Sure. You know, like live in the town, learn how people really are, whatever, but it's dangerous to try and go on that journey so internally, you know? Yeah, definitely. I, I, a big pop reference to that is that Jim and Andy film. Did you see that on Netflix? And the great Jim Jim Andy, yeah. Yeah, it becomes Andy Kaufman. I found that a fascinating film. I mean, it's yeah, amazing, you know, and it yeah. is fascinating, you know, and, that, and what he's going through is really interesting. I wonder how much of it is dramatised for the film. Yeah, same. You know, like- exactly, exactly. But it, even then, that just, for me adds that other little element. Mm. Yeah, but I, I've, I've, I've always loved that sort of... I think you're right, a mixture, where and you don't, it, where you don't really you? know. Like when you do your music, like what, what is the experience for you? Do you feel like you have um, to... Mm. Uh, I, I, th- I think um, you're right. I think there has to be a sort of separation between uh, the narrative voice, I guess, the voice that uses the eye within the song, and the actual experiences that you've experienced. Otherwise, it essentially becomes a diary on paper, and I think people would not listen to you recite your diary. People want mm. to hear your story, if that mm. makes sense. But then, obviously, I think there's some incredibly beautiful songs that are born out of entirely real events. Like, I'm a big fan of um, Sun Kill Moon, who writes, you know, just it, it feels like it's literally pouring out of his mm. mouth. It, as in, he, there, there doesn't seem, really seem to be a particular barrier between uh, him and the whoever is mm. uh, supposedly singing the song. And I've always found that really interesting, but mm. I, I I think you're right. It's, I think we enjoy the artist as a separate character mm. as much as we enjoy both the artist as a human being and the mm. narrative voice. Okay. Have, there's almost like three people at play. You know, it's the, it's the Holy Trinity of, lis- <laughs> of listening yeah. or, to, or enjoying a piece, you know. Yeah. Definitely, and I think I think the, this this notion as well of like the artist identity as art is also very wrapped up in a in a consumerism, you know, like because the, it's like you know I don't know nearly enough about it, but you know when when I talk to my friends who do have some kind of foot in the fine art world, especially at like a level where you know you're at Art Basel and these kind of things and you know showing work, it, it, the question of what can be assessed by most people who buy art. You know, especially even some, I guess, in some ways, in institutions, about what is good art or what is important or what will be important is kind of an unquantifiable thing. But what mm. you can quantify is a story. You can feel a story. You can talk to a story. You can place yourself in a story. 
And yeah. so, you know, the reality is that, that the story of the artist is as important, if not more important, than the work. hundred uh, percent. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's becoming ever more uh, true as well. I don't uh, know if I agree the, the, with the, it, by the way. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, like, yeah, you know, like, exactly. It's just, yeah. but the, the, even just uh, in, from a very consumerist point of view, from a very capitalist point of view, the way that, um, well, we were informed a few years ago um, that the music industry was essentially going to go in a direction that meant it, the artist was going to come first. The artist is going to come before the song. And I don't think I knew what that meant when I was told that. And then the more that you look at things like Spotify and Apple Music, where you'll go on the sort of homepage of these places mm -hmm. and uh, the first thing that you see is a face. It's rarely, a, a, there's rarely music playing. You'll see a face, which mm -hmm. you'll link to music, but then, of course, there's links to social medias and mm -hmm. then you have to present the, a lot of these artists will have to present themselves on platforms like Instagram and TikTok and things. And as soon as you get a glimpse into these people's lives, you're mm -hmm. a little more hooked and you're right. You do care a little more about their stories and to some extent, a little more about their story than the songs that they're writing about these mm -hmm. particular stories or the way that they deviate from those particular stories. And then people will make up their own versions of these mm -hmm. people's stories. And then, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just find that a, a really interesting spiral into the way that, that people, especially in the music industry, seem mm -hmm. to be receiving their favourite artists these days. How, how do you feel about country music? <laughs> uh, I love some of it. It depends. <laughs> but I think I, I, I also think it's sort of like there's it's one of those icebergs where I love Towns Van Zandt and John Prine um, mm -hmm. and I guess some of the of Dylan's record. I'm a massive Bob Dylan fan, so some of those records would be lit. But then also uh, sometimes when we're on tour, we listen to a song called uh, honky tonk padonka donk, which is about a woman with an enormous ass walking into a bar in like rural Kansas, and it's right. four minutes I'd choose not to listen to on a regular basis. Right. But I think there's 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 a bigger iceberg that sounds a lot more like that. Why do you ask? Uh, I mean, other than the fact that I'm just a huge Randy Newman fan. Um, oh yeah, but um, not to plug another um, podcast on your podcast, but. Please, um, please. But there's a Malcolm Gladwell does a great um, podcast called Revisionist History, um, and and I you know it's very popular. And in it, there's a great episode which talks about country music, and it said something that I'd never really thought about, which is like that the the power of country music is the fact that it's specific, and the power of rock is that it's or, or you know popular music is that it's more generic, you know. Right, universal. So like you said in your, like the Honky Tonk song, you have this song which is about this very specific event, this very specific woman with very specific features <laughs> entering a very yeah. specific place and me having very specific feelings about that. It's very, like, it's very prescriptive. There's a scene, there's a place, there's a person and they're real. Yeah. You know? um, and I, I kind of fell in love with that and, and it made me reconsider a lot of my feelings about country music. <laughs> yeah. um, because you know when I grew up it was like me telling my dad to please turn the Joni Mitchell off you know not that even maybe Joni Mitchell's not quite country enough for the country music fans but you know um, but it was amazing when I realised that because it's what we're talking about it's this idea of a story you know mm -hmm. like um, and I guess like there's something very interesting about you know in any way that you tell a story trying to move towards the specific and how that can really be emotional in a way that maybe things that are generic can't be. You know, like the, the example they give is, you know, they, they talk about one specific country song, which I can't remember, you know, um, in comparison to Rolling Stones' Wild Horses. I think it's Rolling Stones. Um, I'm not really a Rolling Stones fan, so I don't, I don't know, but I think so. You've got it, you've, you've got it, right, you've got it right, man. You're saying something again, don't worry. Um, but, um, but, you know, like they're talking about that and, and it's like, you know, Wild Horses, which is about this, you know, I think it's like a death of a girlfriend and being beside her bedside from memory. Mm. Um, you know, it's moving, but it doesn't make you cry. But this other song, you know, basically you're, you're crying by the, the second verse because it's much more specific, whereas that song is about this metaphorical image of horses, you know, yeah. and wild and what that means. And, you yeah. know, the... 
I, I think that's interesting. You know, I, I don't know how that definitely yeah. we're talking about, but I just want to. No, it, it definitely <laughs> does. And it comes, it, well, it comes back to the idea. I, I think universe, like universality sort of links into specificity some of the time because you get some of those, some of those Randy Newman songs. It's like, he can be writing those songs about um, like Alabama and like the, uh, the, what's that amazing song about the flood? Birmingham. Mm. Is that the song, name of the song? About the floods in his hometown. Or he'll be writing about the first ships to come over mm. from Africa. And, He's singing a lot of the time from like he'll sing the, a song from the point of the view of a slave, mm-hmm. and it's so specific and it's so intrinsic, and he'll and he'll make um, some very uh, it'll be a quote or it'll be a name or a place or a river or mm. uh, I think I think he uses the n word in some songs, which he does, which I don't, which I don't necessarily agree with, but you know, yeah, but <laughs> but he's uh, but uh, yeah, so so he's 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 utilizing these for, storytelling for all techniques. People. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, but then it feels like in him telling the story in this way, it, you zoom out, you get this like overarching, generalizing view of his views on mankind, on love, on peace, on happiness. And I'm not saying that you could repl- re- replace any of his lyrics with some more generic Rolling Stones lyrics, but it does sort of like in its specificity, it immediately makes you think of these universal yeah. themes. It makes you think of love and freedom and mm. respect and short people mm-hmm. and you know whatever Randy Newman decides to sing about that day and I think I think the great artists do that mm-hmm. Dylan and Cohen do it and Joni Mitchell does it mm-hmm. and then I think uh, filmmakers can focus on it as well when you think David Lynch is being particularly strange in a film I think a lot of the time you sort of like you stand back mm-hmm. and you witness it and you, you experience it in a different light and it's about love or it's about brotherhood or it's about you know your relationship to your dad and stuff like that and it's mm-hmm. that's why I always find sort of like if someone's focusing on something, they're focusing on it, not necessarily for a reason, but it's nice to at least think of one yourself. Yeah, and I mean, look, you know, to, to work it all back into our conversation about that music video, I guess, like, um, the, the best part about it was, you know, you, you, you submit a lot of pictures as a director and you try to put your specific feelings and heart into it. And then inevitably, and, you know, not by anyone's fault, just because of the machine and all the things, you know, things tend to get pulled out of that specificity very quickly and they move into generalisation. You know, part of that is practical about what you can do and part of that is also just about there being many cooks in the kitchen. Um, and, um, And it was really lovely on this one, you know, that like I remember we had that first phone call in like, Oh, probably November or something now and it was like mm-hmm. I was really waiting for you guys to go like you know we love the pitch we just you know we're from the UK <laughs> you know like, <laughs> I don't think I think there was I think there was an option at one point because you were saying um I think you have relations from the, from Wales right my family's from, from Wales um, yeah yeah because we were talking because my 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 dad's side of the family are also from South Wales, and we're like that would be kind of dope because the, you know there's the, there's all these sort of like rural landscapes, and it could it could look sick, and there's these. But yeah. at the same time, I'm glad we I'm glad we stuck with it, man. Yeah, like, 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 it the, you don't, yeah. yeah. And there's and your familiarity with those places, I think, lent itself to the final product, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, it was like. I mean, it's all, they were all places from like my childhood and my, my father's childhood, you know? Yeah. And like, that's, yeah. that's really where I grew up. And, and um, it, weirdly also like the first feature film I worked on, which was a film called Snowtown was also shot in that community. Um, mm-hmm. It's a fantastic film. If you haven't seen it, you should definitely go see it. I think. You have that. told me to watch this before and yeah. I do need to watch it. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. Not put it, put it, it on, put it on the real list. Like take it off the, like the list list and put it on the actual list, you know? Like, okay. Actual list. <laughs> right, okay. It's going on. It's um, going on, man. But, um, Are you watching? Okay. It's going on. Like whatever you were going to watch on Netflix tonight, just like, don't do that. <laughs> Put down the cooking show. <laughs> I've actually got, I've, uh, yeah, I've actually, I've cleared my latest uh, binge watching. So yeah, that, it's got, it's on the list. Perfect. Um, but you know, so the director of that, Justin Cazell, is a you know, really, really incredible director. And, um, you know, and I, I was also spending a lot of time in that area, you know, work when I was on that film. Um, and, it, you know, that there's just like, I think like, you know, it's, it's really shitty truism that you get told all the time, especially if you went to any kind of film school or whatever, you know, where they're like, write from what you know. And you want to be like, screw you. You know, I can write whatever the hell I goddamn please. Yeah. Right. And and they're wrong. They're wrong in some way. You know, like imagination and 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 you know, writing about what you know can often be rather hindering. But I think there's like something to be said for like writing from what you know. You know? Oh definitely. So like 
these these things that are you know like I, I really love this music video I really do and I, I don't like often a lot of the stuff that I make you know as a lot of people right um, but I love it because it feels really genuinely connected to that family to Jaden and, and and you know and Nathan and and Skylar who are real people and are a real family yeah. um, and feels very connected to that community you know yeah. Um, and, and I think that comes from, you know, not necessarily writing about what you know. Like I didn't really grow up in Devron Park, you know, um, but I did grow up in this kind of lost northern suburbs of Adelaide. Um, yeah. And I think lots of the pieces of the toxic masculinity that, that exists there, lots of the pieces of the, um, you know, socioeconomic situation and that kind of, we call it like the Aussie battler. Which is, which is actually rather, I would say, like a term of endearment, you know. Like mm. there's a lot of working man's wisdom in Australia like everywhere. But um, all of that, you know, is all through there. So, um, yeah, it was, it was nice to do in that way. So thank you for letting me go and do it. Oh, no, really, our pleasure. No, really, it's one of our favourite things we've ever uh, been able to put our name to, oh. don't worry. But, um, so talking about Jaden and his family, how did you meet those guys? You know, it's so funny and, like, it was the opposite of how you, how I would normally, as a director, be like, "This is how this is how we'll meet them." So I spent like a long time door knocking, flyering suburbs, hanging out in shopping centres, which was like how I talked about how we do it, and that's you know normally how you get great real people cast. And while I was doing this, my really amazing producer Christiana, um, she was like, "Look, you know, I have a bit of a casting background." I think this is a great approach and we'll meet amazing people. And we did, you know, and, and some of the people that we that ended up in the film were from that. But I'm just going to put a call out to some casting people and just see what happens, you know. And in my head I was like, that's great, like, thank you so much, but also like, oh, God, let's not go down this, this you know, stairway to hell. Where, where basically, you know, you end up with the stage kids and, and all of this stuff, right? Because also, there's, you know, there's not a lot of money, right? Yeah. And just for some reason, someone emailed the right person and some agent sent Jaden in, you know, and his dad. So he actually came from the traditional boring casting call. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, um, and he's, you know, he's an actor. You know, I mean, he's not trained, trained, you know, but like he's mm. done stage performance and he's really experienced. Yeah, that's it. And but there's a, there's a, there's a bond between those guys. That yeah. I, it's just magic how that came about. It's like, yeah. I get his dad, his dad's not a trained actor, right? No, but he could be, you know, like, yeah, he, that's the he's thing. A and there's this, guy. The, yeah, there's, they're a captivating family and there's this bond between all of them that I don't think could have been could have been caught necessarily by everyone and couldn't have been you you can't just immediately judge but the way that it's the way that you manage to sort of like delve into their lives you see mm-hmm. these connections you see these strands between them mm-hmm. and it's so vital to the music that it makes it so such an interesting watch how did you find how, how long did you spend with them I mean, it was actually really short. So normally when I do stuff like in a community, I mean, I guess I was helped by the fact that I'm an, I am an Adelaide boy, but mm. normally you take weeks, if not months, you know, mm. but just because of the nature of this, I think, you know, I think we had like, I had 10 days. I got on a plane from Berlin. I flew to, or maybe 15 or something, you know, but like flew to Australia, got off the plane, had a day of adjusting the jet lag. I was casting, street casting for two days and door knocking. Then the producer turned up and we did a proper casting. And then we hung out for a couple of days, like just like at the local skate park and whatever else, you know, and at their house and just chatted and ha- went to the pub a bunch and had a bunch of beers. Nice. But really it was like two days of, you know, then, you know, writing the script with them. Mm. Um, and then we shot it and we shot for, I think, three days or maybe four. Yeah. How did you find uh, the script writing came together with those guys? Really easy. I mean, you know, it's like easy because part of it is, you know, scenes from my childhood and part of it was also genuinely scenes from from their life, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think there's more of a – the question is not can you write a script, the question is can you write a script that's ethical and can you, especially with real people, and can you write it in a way that they really feel 
you know, done justice by it, you know, and not taken advantage of. Um, you know, and, and I think that was, we really, I think we did achieve that. Um, yeah. You know, and then especially when you're dealing with sensitive things, that's difficult to do, you know. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. How, um, was it you leading the script writing or did those guys sort of have ideas of themselves with the sort of like family life that they could integrate into the script? It's just easy. You just like, I turn up with like a bunch of ideas and I, you kind of know what the film should be about because you got this treatment, yeah. and, you know, you know, you kind of have the story, um, you know, in very broad strokes. And then you just say like, you know, these are some scenes and places and memories that are attached to those places that I have. Hmm. Tell me about your life, you know. Yeah. And you just sit and talk and, you know, I, like one of my favourite, two, two of my favourite things was like that I never would have thought of was like, so their house that they live in really is like right next to this train line, you know, like, and, and they often like just wait till they can hear the train and then run to jump the fence and go catch the train, which is like one of those opening shots of the film. Yeah. And it's like this stuff, you couldn't, you just can't make it up, no. you know, and, and same with that scene at, at the, like, do you have Pizza Hut in, in the UK? Oh, big time. Great. Okay. It's a global phenomenon. Excellent. So Pizza oh, Hut yeah. for me was like so many memories. Like my, my one biggest childhood memory is me like spewing all over the ground, like projectile vomit, like out of like a comedy film at Pizza Hut. So weirdly, you know, whenever I step into it, I still smell vomit. Like it's that thing. But, <laughs> um, you know, uh, this has not become very good advertising for Pizza Hut, this conversation. But um, <laughs> Luckily, we're not sponsored by them. We're a, domino, we're a Domino's podcast. Got it, great. Um, but, um, yeah, and, and so, you know, like that scene at the beginning also of like, you know, him and his mum and that birthday was actually his birthday. It just happened to be happening. Right, and so it's this beautiful thing of like chance also where it's like, you know, I have so many memories of that. And it still kind of, it shouldn't still really exist. It's really something from my childhood, from the 90s. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I was going to say, did, do you sort of cast Jaden as yourself? I don't, I, don't, I don't know if it was about myself. It was more like a combination of things that I saw in him that I felt like I could relate to, like with any casting. Mm. And then also things that... Um, you know, I saw in him that I saw in my father and all the, the, the men that I knew and grew up with, you know, and boys, you know, when I was young. Um, so I think, you know, you, you can't, you shouldn't lie to yourself. I think you have to be conscious of the fact that you're always drawn towards what you like in yourself, you know, in yeah. others, right? Um, so there's definitely an element of that. But, you know, I think, I think there were other stories that he also you know, in testament to also his ability as an actor could, could carry. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely amazing. So, yeah, that was cool, right? Um, I'm looking forward to meeting Matthew. I think we'll, we'll get on in person as well. Um, but, yeah, please go and check out his uh, his work online. He's got a website and his portfolio is on Stink Films website, which is the production company with which we who, uh, who we worked with to get The Only Boy Racer made. And if you haven't seen the video for The Only Boy Racer, just go on YouTube, watch that. I mean, it sounds like I'm sort of like tooting my own trumpet there, really, but um, I don't care. It's fucking worth it. You'll love it. Um, yeah, another podcast coming soon. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>